It's Power Hour, LSU. PHL, extra little bit of swag and extra little bit of taste. Let's freaking go. Let's you. Yeah, I understand we are starting while there is a ball game going on. Guess what? We keep it churning, baby, because there is some good news on the horizon. LSU looks to be getting another commitment at the running back position. That is JT Lindsay. A four-star running back. Uh, I saw earlier today he did not have a rival's recruiting ranking, and magically today he got a three-star ranking from them. He is a four-star running back overall. On three, views him way more highly, obviously, than the other services. 247 doesn't even have a ranking on him. ESPN doesn't either. Three-star running back. It looks as if he's going to commit to LSU. They turned up the steam today. He's from Alexandria, Louisiana. Of course, the last time LSU had a three-star skill position player from the state of uh, Louisiana and from Alexandria, went to Alexandria High School, was DJ Chark roughly a decade ago. So maybe JT Lindsay follows in his footsteps. Big shout out to him. And he would be running back number two that commits to LSU. Now, I've not really watched a whole lot of him. I, I um, turned on the tape for a little bit earlier today. I had some obligations uh, with uh, my other channels. Uh, but I, I did watch him. A kind of bizarre offense that they run at Alexandria. It's, it honestly is an offense that you – Never really have seen before how they actually line up and and use your use their running backs at a shotgun. Um, but he does have some explosiveness. He was unfreaking believably dominant. So you do like to see those things. Um, uh, but for me, you guys know what the number one thing I look for from a running back is if you're thick and he's not really the thickest guy at 185 pounds. Obviously, um, some of it could come down to his actual age, right? DJ Chark was also, ironically, one of the youngest LSU recruits ever. So if he is on the younger scale, that means he's got more growing to do. And also, uh, LSU does need another running back for this class. I hope this does not deter James Simon uh, from committing to LSU. I don't think it will, but if they do take JT Lindsay's commitment, which they will, they wouldn't have offered and turned up the heat the way that they did. Um, for them to have Simon as well, you would need to have three running backs in the same recruiting class, and three is a big number. Normally, you have two uh, in each class, at least one in pretty much every class. I think the last class LSU did not have a running back was 2013. So you normally have two, right? And for right now, uh, LSU already has one and Lindsey would be two. I would want for sure uh, th th James Simon to be a part of this class as well. And hopefully that is still in the cards because sometimes you'll turn up the heat on a different player simply because another player uh, is starting to fade. So Hopefully that's not the case because I do think James Simon is really freaking good. But what a lot of you care about is not 2025 recruiting. You care about right here, right now. You want something right here, right now that can help the team next year. Okay. I got some good news. 
You can go to Patreon right now, patreon.com slash LSU football. I've already done a film study today uh, in hopes and in positive vibes that Philip Blitty, Blitty, I don't know how to say his last name, but I would be Liddy if Blitty committed. This is a very nice defensive line prospect. Six foot three, 295 pounds, four years at Indiana. Four. Okay, so this is a grown man. And he actually spent his first three years at Texas Tech. Excuse my French. I actually went today. And this is always the number one thing that I hear from you guys when it comes to a transfer. Well, he was in so-and-so conference. He was in the Big Ten. He was in the Pac-12. So what I decided to do was, okay, Indiana played Michigan this year. Let me see how Phillip played versus Michigan. Michigan's got as good of an offensive line you're going to see uh, in the sport last year. I would say they had the best. Either them or Georgia or ours. I think we have the best now. But still, Michigan, really, really good offensive line. And you go to Patreon, and you could get a film breakdown of how I felt he performed in that game. So this is what I would say, all right, about Phillip. He could play. He could play. He would be the best defensive tackle on our team right now. That does not mean he is special. That does not mean he is Ricky Jean Francois or like Ron Brooks's teammate, that does not mean he is Michael Brockers, Benny Logan, Anthony Freak Johnson. It doesn't, doesn't mean that. Not what I'm saying. He would be the best defensive tackle on our team right now if he were to commit. Now, you guys don't care about my opinion. You guys care. Is he going to commit to LSU? And the answer to that is maybe. It's going to come down to how much we are willing <laughs> to ramp things up. Uh, a good defensive tackle in the transfer portal is going at a premium. I go back to what Josh Pate tweeted out. I, I normally agree, honestly, with, with a lot of things that Josh Pate says. I've disagreed, of course, with him. Uh, in the past, but I do take it as signal that he said that there are quite a few programs that are after defensive linemen and in particular defensive tackles. And I've worked a few back channels myself, and I have learned of a few programs that are in the same exact spot as we are. Our situation is a lot more desperate than those other schools. Uh, we need defensive tackles. So, Philip would 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 be a really good player for us. Um, I I think he is in the mold of a not as good of a playmaker, but probably an an overall just more consistent down to down player than Jordan Jefferson was for us last year. And Jordan Jefferson was very good for us last year and uh, a, a rough scheme and no real defensive line coach. So I, I think Bleedy uh, w would fit that mold. Jefferson, more of a penetrator, playmaker type. Bleedy, a little bit more of a block eater. You know, his numbers, Philip, they aren't spectacular, but I, I thought he was pretty good. I, I really, really, really did. Uh, so there you go. Now, here's the good news. I'm just going to be honest. Super Chats have been a little dry. So go to up the ante. I'm going to give out one of my favorite cards, one of the most popular players on this channel. We hope one day that, uh, that this young man's aunt will join our channel, the great Joy Taylor. We're giving out a Mason Taylor, rookie refractor, first $20 super chatter is getting this in the mail from yours truly. Also, before we get into another transfer portal defensive tackle that I've been asked about nonstop, um, let me also throw this out here. I will. I am going to the spring game this weekend. I've not been to a spring game in God knows how long. I know. I know. I'm not missing uh, 
uh, a whole lot, but I kind of want to go because uh, I want to meet as many of you as I possibly can. So on tomorrow's live stream, I will have a final like little destination where we can meet before the game and walk in together. You can all sit together at the spring game. There's no assigned seating. Uh, I normally like to sit a little bit higher uh, at games. Uh, that's just my preference, but uh, obviously not at the like nosebleeds, but you know, central as high as I possibly can get. Um, but yeah, I'm going to the spring game this weekend. I say let's meet at like Mike's cage. Uh, what time does spring game kick, kick off about one? So meet there around noon. Uh, or does spring game kick off at, at two? I should know this. I think it's two. So I guess Mike's cage at one. Uh, let me quadruple check. It is okay. So it is at one central. All right. So noon. Let's do that. Noon, noon p.m. central. This weekend. All right. So there you go. Um, looking forward to meeting and, and seeing all of you tonight. Okay. Now, I know a lot of you got it. But you don't have this. $20. That's all it is. And it's coming to you in the mail. Mason Taylor. Now, a lot of you have been asking me about, about Bear Alexander. Okay. The LSU uh, defensive tackle, and look, um, I say the LSU defensive tackle, the USC defensive tackle, he has decided to enter the portal, all right? And look, the transfer portal is a great thing. It is an absolute great thing. I think it's great for college football. It's made middle-tier schools, uh, not us, we're, the, we're in the elites, but it makes middle-tier schools like Ole Miss have a chance to win or really make a push for the national championship. A school like Missouri can really make a push for a natty. Uh, if you get a few things right, you can get one good portal class and get things going. We saw what Washington was able to do. I do think the transfer portal is a really good thing. But I think it is a major, major, major red flag if you're at three schools in three different years and all three of them are elite schools. OK, Barry Alexander, first year, he's at Georgia. He's at Georgia. If you're a decent rotational defensive tackle at Georgia, you are going to get drafted and have your life set for you for, for forever. So Bear Alexander, he was going to play a lot this last year at Georgia, went to USC, USC a higher bidder. They don't have good defensive linemen out west. So Bear Alexander goes to USC. Obviously, there's a defensive coordinator switch. USC is still an elite program. You, you were still a starter. You still played a lot. New DC probably doesn't like the scheme. I get transferring there. But that's your third elite school in three years. Third elite school in three years. Now, I'm going to add one more thing into this. He went to four different high schools. Let me repeat. Four different high schools. So, in the last seven years of him playing football, he has played at seven different schools. I, I have never seen that before. Now, could it be that coaching changes happen at all those different schools? Sure. It, it, that, that very well uh, could, could be the case. But seven different schools in seven years? Look, Bear Alexander could be telling LSU, hey, I'm committing right now. But if I'm Brian Kelly, I would say, hey, this would be a question I would ask any player that played at seven different schools in seven years. Uh, what? What? Really? Like, that happens in the NFL. Barkevious Mingo played six years in the NFL with six different teams. That happens there. But college? In high school? Seven different schools? Seven years? That, that's, that's a lot. And he is a five-star. He was, he was a five-star recruit. All right, so elite recruit. 
Let me get his exact uh, recruiting ranking here. Okay. And apparently he attended five different schools uh, in, in high school. Played at four different ones. Oh, okay. So he wasn't quite a five-star on Rivals. He was a five-star, but he was a top 50 composite recruit. Now, I know what a lot of you would say. Well, Carter, look. He was at USC in Georgia. He's a better player than Philip Bleedy. He's not. Okay. He's not. I don't, I don't think he is. And I know what some of you would say as well. well. Carter, we're not in a position to say no to anyone. I'm not saying no to Bear Alexander. I'm just telling you, if I were Brian Kelly, I would be asking a lot of questions. And there were times when when I watched USC and I was like, what what are they doing at defensive tackle? What what's the what what's the plan? What's the scheme? Now, I know what some of you would say as well. well Carter will only need him for a year. And then Dominic McKinley will be ready for year two to 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 dominate and we'll have a few more transfers in and 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 we'll be good to go. Jakeem Thanos Stewart might be reclassifying to 2025, and he very well could be the best defensive line recruit in the history of Louisiana football coming out of New Orleans. And we, we might be sent. We might only need Barry Alexander for one year. And that's fine. I'm, I'm, I'm down for a one-year rental if I get a lead defensive tackle play. My question for you is, have you actually watched him play? Have you actually done a thorough evaluation? Sometimes it's hard to do that. We live busy lives. Defensive tackle is a very hard position to evaluate because you don't know the full schemes and, and whatnot. Um, you know, I, I'm i fine with it. If he's interested in coming to LSU, I'm certainly okay with it. Obviously, it's hard to have an ego with uh, someone like Bo Davis who normally gets the most out of his players. Uh, is 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 very hard nose uh, with with his players, coachable guy, playable, uh, uh, player friendly guy, but he's going to be very hard on you. Is that something that's going to 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 fit in with what LSU is trying to do? Is that going to fit in with your culture? So, I don't know where Bay Alexander wants to go. I'm just telling you is I I don't think it's good for any young athlete to play at three different elite schools in three years. Now, if you're a zero star recruit and you started at Juco level and then you went to McNeese and then you jumped to LSU, that's a different thing. But three elite schools and you were at the premier school for defensive linemen. Georgia. <laughs> There's no debating that. And it wasn't good enough for you. And they factor in the seven different schools in seven years. It's a lot. It's a lot. Now, I don't know Bear personally. I'm, I'm not saying anything uh, about him personally. I'm just telling you what the facts are. But we'll see. We'll see. Now, That's the thing. No college degree yet. Or you might have one. You, you might you might have had a ton of college credits and, and enrolled early. I don't know. But that's that's a lot. That's a lot. Now, next thing I'll bring up. And I do think this was pretty big today when it comes to the world of college football. There was a report that happened at Oregon State. Today, that their best player entered the transfer portal. All right. Pretty good running back. Martinez, number six. His first name, uh, I think it's Dennis Martinez or, or something like that. Really, really good running back in the Pac-12. Okay. Now, are we interested in him? I don't know. 
I really, really, really don't know. But what I do think was pretty big about this transfer and why I think this could have an effect on LSU, it could have an effect on everyone, is the national reporter named Pete Thamel included what Oregon State was paying him. Let me repeat, a national reporter that covers college football. We're not talking about Adam Schefter at ESPN reporting two years, 20 million, five of it guaranteed. We're not talking about A.J. Wojnarowski. Talking about 15 years guaranteed, 15 million guaranteed. That's not what we're talking about. We are talking about a college football player. Now, I'm going to bring up one thing that I found to be so interesting. He was getting paid $400,000. Let me repeat. $400,000. Not a quarterback, a running back at Oregon State. Four hundred k. Is there another school out there that's offering them more? Are we going to see a world where we we see even more college players have their amounts poured out into the world? I don't know. You tell me. Okay? So, I do think $400,000, it's a lot of money. But is it enough? Okay, now I've got a lot of good words and good vibes from our new intro, but what I want to show you is the man behind what this intro actually turned out to be, my guy KC. Um, I want to shout him out. I think he's watching uh, from Germany, so here he is. Carter the Power Bryant. Just a little bit of swagger, just a little bit of taste. My dog is Casey, a.k.a. Kenya Dig, serving out of Kaderbach, Germany. I'm the one who did the song for the intro that Dex made you. I'm glad that you like it. I love what you do. Continue grinding. I hope this video brings more exposure to your platform. This is an opportunity that was unimaginable to me, so I deeply appreciate it, man. I'm going to be tuning in, so let's make some shake. Power Hour LSU. Let's get it. See. All right, I just went to uh, reset the internet. I think some of you said I was blurry. Um, so there you go. $400,000. Shout out to KC. Please go follow him on social media. I will pull up his Instagram page here in just a second yet again. Um, 400K. Is, 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 is that too much or is that too little for an elite running back? $400,000. Hmm. I don't know about you. I, I, I don't know if I would risk. I don't, I don't, I don't know if I would risk losing that much money. If I didn't know for sure I was getting at least 600000 or maybe 500000 Maybe it's that Oregon State doesn't have a home right now. Maybe that's part of the issue when it comes to conferences. But I don't know. $400,000. Huh? 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 All right, I'm going to try um I'm going to try and I was going to save this little video for later. Uh I wanted to s- discuss some Ricky Collins and AJ Swan. So, 
uh, we shall do that. I wanted to play this clip, though, all right, uh, because th there's a huge push for Ricky Collins to be the QB, too. And at this point, Ricky's done a lot to really show that he really wants his job. You know, going out to California, training with, training with Jaden and, you know, being a different type of quarterback than Garrett Nussmeyer, A.J. Swan and Garrett Nussmeyer are both more of your pocket quarterbacks. But I want you to take a look at A.J. Swan last year versus a really good Tennessee defense. Let's go! Let's chat some A.J. Swan. Just a quick little look-see right here. Um, this throw in particular, right, was a huge part of the LSU offense last year. And it's very difficult uh, to complete these types of throws on a consistent basis, right? And the funny thing about it was LSU the year before uh, this one, they tried these kind of slot-ish kind of fades over and over and over again, and it didn't work. But this year, the slot fade, you can argue, was LSU's best concept. So you'll see right here, Will Shepard isn't in the slot per se, but he is, um, the, the splits here are really tight. What I like about this play in particular is the protection, okay? It doesn't have to be good. You can see right here, the right guard gets beat really badly, as badly as he probably could have been beat. But because this is a quick, vertical, explosive pass play, you don't need great protection. Bro also inherently shields DBs away from the football, right? It's kind of a Willie Mays over the top uh, of the shoulder type of catch. So you see Swan steps into this throw and just perfect spiral. I mean, that thing is tight. And as you'll see, even if the DB had perfect coverage. So we get to here, and it's not quite apples to apples because obviously this is a three wide receiver set instead of a two. But you'll notice that the protection here isn't the best. It's also not the worst. This twist stunt does um, kind of sort of get home, but because it's a quicker, deep passing pattern, Jane's able to get this off. Once again, a perfectly tight spiral. And you'll see the coverage isn't bad, but if we throw it at a diagonal to where he can make an over-the-shoulder catch like that, it is truly an indefensible throw. So, Hopefully, A.J. Swan can do that, or Garrett Nussmeyer, whoever is the starter. Let's go. So, it's going to be interesting. You, you, you saw what A.J. Swan could do. And you have to keep in mind that he has way more starts than any other quarterback in this room. Actually, combined. Tons of throws. And he did throw to really good receivers at Vanderbilt. One transferred to Georgia, another transferred to Colorado. All right. The truth here is I'm feeling that Ricky is going to, to get the QB2 reps on Saturday. That's where my feel is at this point. But, once again, that's just my feel. It could be A.J. getting the QB2 reps. I don't know. I really, really, really don't know. This is definitely one of the closer backup battles we have had in quite some time. You know, when Jaden was here in, in year one, we did have a intense backup battle between Miles Brennan and Garrett Nussmeyer. But... That got sorted out. And then you had Garrett Nussmeyer versus Walker Howard. Garrett always had that year of experience on Walker. This is a little bit different, though. You have Ricky Collins, who's been in the system, knows the system, knows the receivers, is from Louisiana. You got A.J. Swan, who was a good but not great starter at Vanderbilt, but he does have all this starter's experience. And you do have two different skill sets here at play. So I I find it to be very interesting. And we'll, we'll see if A.J. Swan and his experience wins out eventually in this quarterback battle. But we shall see. 
Now, next thing, obviously, we are a few days removed from uh, what was an absolutely crazy uh, women's basketball NCAA tournament. I think one thing that kind of fell under the radar was how crazy the first two games were in uh, Baton Rouge of the of the NCAA tournament for the ladies. And look, it's it's honestly breathtaking <laughs> watching this sport continue to grow. Hope it continues to grow um, into something even better. And it's not just one star in Caitlin Clark. Hopefully it is. Um, you know, this this momentum continues to build um, in women's basketball. I do feel not only from a bias standpoint that it would have been nice instead of NC State if it was LSU in the Final Four. Then you would have had the the four big stars, big brands of this past year, but we did get the Elite Eight game between Caitlin and LSU. So I'm really excited about the future, not only LSU women's basketball, but the future of the sport. And it's going to be really hard to beat South Carolina next year. I mean, they're still going to be really good. Okay. They're still going to be really, really, really good. I do want to bring up men's basketball uh, before going into baseball here, and then we'll get back into football. Matt McMahon, all right, you, you, things just got harder. So John Calipari, you could say what you want. Um, is he an upgrade over Eric Musselman? I don't think it's a massive, massive, massive upgrade because Musselman's in the prime of his career, and Cal is obviously a Hall of Famer, but he's been on the downturn. But he's still pretty good. And Kentucky's going to bring someone else elite in. And when Kentucky brings whoever else they're going to bring in to run their program, it'll be the deepest men's basketball coaching tree in in one conference that you will ever see in the SEC. I don't think it could get any better than what it's going to be next year. All right? So... I, I am very concerned about LSU basketball. And I I I it's gonna be a big year for Matt McMahon. It really, really, really is. Because yes, it really doesn't change a whole lot because Kentucky and Arkansas were already ahead of us, but it does show you that these schools have some heavy mother freaking hitters. I mean, Chris Beard was the hottest name in coaching just a few years ago. And he's what the seventh or eighth best coach in this conference now. I mean, it's, it's going to be hard, man. It's going to be very, very, very hard. Uh, so looking forward to that. Hopefully we bring in some big time transfers. I honestly thought our transfer class last year was pretty good, but we didn't talk about this. Um, too much, but Jalen Cook officially is going to the NBA, and we'll, we'll we'll see how things turn out after that. Now, before I get into some LSU baseball chatter, I do want to shout out our shop, powerhourlsu.com slash shop. Got a few merch orders over the last couple of days. I am rocking some of my favorite PHL merch. Please get some. Got to pay the web bill. PowerHourLSU.com slash shop. We got mugs. We've got cups. We've got shirts, sweaters, hoodies. And I am wearing my long sleeve Power Hour LSU shirt. PowerHourLSU.com slash shop. Make sure you get your stuff, y'all. So y'all could be looking so friggin'. Swag and Ocious. Okay. Now. Bear Jones. Apparently went off today. Three home runs. Oh. 
Big NBA news. Giannis went down with an injury. Ooh. Ooh. We shall see. Obviously, that's a huge domino in the Eastern Conference. But LSU baseball, they they win tonight versus McNeese. Now, let's take a look at their upcoming schedule, and let's see if they can ride this offensive momentum and make a very strong push for the postseason. Obviously, at this point, if you're an LSU baseball fan, you're just hoping that they could find a way to get to the postseason. That's it. Now, there is good and bad news, and you can spin this either way. All right? You could spin it either way. The good news... Well, actually, I'm going to start with the bad news. Start with the bad news first, right? The bad news is the SEC might be the deepest SEC that has ever existed in SEC baseball. It really is that good. And we still have to play an SEC schedule. That sucks. When you need wins and you have a tough schedule, it sucks. It really, really, really sucks. But the good news is you have a tough schedule remaining. And if you do get some wins and you are able to, let's say, upset Tennessee this weekend, win two out of three, guess what's going to happen? There's going to be some people that say, well, you know what, LSU, they're they're LSU. We want to put them in the tournament. They're a big brand. (laughs) But... You know, as you go through the schedule, just take a look at the ranking. All right, so so far, LSU has played the number four team on the road. They played the number six team at home, the number one team on the road, the number eight team at home, and then Mississippi State on the road, very hostile environment, and, well, it was a tough series. (laughs) It's always tough to play your first series on the road. And then after Tennessee... You get Missouri, they're not good. You have to go, or you do welcome Auburn. That series last year got weird. So it does get easier. You get Texas A&M at home. Alabama on the road. Ole Miss, well, they're kind of good, they're kind of bad. So the schedule isn't brutal, but it's still an SEC schedule that you have to play the rest of the way. And it is relatively favorable. With that said, with that said, they can get hot and sneak their way into the NCAA tournament. It's not that this team is devoid of talent. It's just, well, our schedule was kind of front-loaded. And it's really, really tough to win any SEC series. Um It's tough to win midweek games, as many of you have seen this year. Okay? So, there you go. Okay. Still waiting on some good news here on Giannis. We shall see.
Hmm. Nothing crazy. Nothing crazy. Now, <sighs> this is what I'm hoping as well. So I, I shared some thoughts a little bit earlier on, on Philip Bleedy. He is a thumbnail image. At this point, he's he's going to visit LSU, and then Oklahoma um, is, is another one of his suitors. And, well, their NIL is good, okay? Uh, they lost a kid in NIL to, to Missouri uh, this offseason. But Oklahoma, I mean, they're going to support their football team. The reason why that's a big deal is, yes, this young man only has one year of eligibility left, Philip Bleedy. But Oklahoma is on our schedule. All right. And one thing I think that is going to be huge uh, for, for college football fans, and really if you're a fan of a team in the SEC, football recruiting is not at um, it's not as much of a zero-sum game anymore in the SEC. Now, what, what do I mean by that? Well, now they just take the two best teams in the SEC for the SEC championship game. That's how it works. So it's no longer an SEC West versus SEC East thing. And for years, for the last three years, and in particular two years ago, uh, or a year and a half, honestly, I made a last-second trip to go see LSU-Alabama. Because that was the last true LSU Alabama game. And obviously this year as well, but we already had two losses and whatever. But LSU Alabama is not what it used to be, and it never will be the same because we're no longer in the same division. Alabama, you know, our season for the last 10 years has been all about the Alabama game. You know, you. you we had to win that game for us to really do something in the in the college football postseason. And we didn't win that game a whole lot. Now we're going to win it more because, you know, Saban isn't there. But it's just not as big of a deal. But what is going to be a bigger deal over the next couple of seasons is your recruiting battles. In particular, in the transfer portal with younger players. Let's just say... Philip Bleedy ends up going to Auburn. I don't know if he has any interest from Auburn, but let's just say he ends up going to Auburn. It's not as big of a deal is as if he went if he goes to Arkansas or if he goes to Oklahoma, because we have to play them this next year. But not only do we have to play them this next year, we have to play them the year after. All right, so you have this. 16 team conference and there are 15 other schools in the conference and you're playing the same exact eight teams in year one as you are year two. So the more important recruiting battles really are the teams that are only on your schedule. That's it. That's it. So I was thinking about this when I was cutting an Auburn film study over the weekend. Auburn has had the best true freshman that we have seen in spring up to this point in Cam Coleman. He's going to be a superstar. All right, he is going to be a stud. I'll tell you right now. We picked a good time for Auburn to not be on our schedule anymore. Hugh Freeze is a good coach. Eventually we'll get Auburn going. And now they've got a dude that's tough to guard. And we've had issues in our secondary. We don't have to worry about it anymore because we don't play Auburn anymore. We don't. And we don't know what the schedule is going to look like three years from now. So over this spring portal period, really pay attention to the players that either go to LSU or the players that go to teams that are on our schedule. Now, 
we could be jockeying for playoff position with teams that are on the opposite side of our schedule. Texas being one of those schools, Tennessee being one of those schools, Missouri being one of those schools, Georgia obviously being one of those schools. But we can't do anything about those schools. We can only control who we play in our schedule. So hopefully Bleedy does not go to Oklahoma and he picks us. But we'll see what happens. Okay. And we will not play Auburn anytime in the foreseeable future. At least in the next two seasons, which is wild. So we don't have to worry about Cam Coleman until year three. Or if we see him in the SEC titles game or in the playoffs. We say hi to William. What's up? I'm looking forward to seeing William this weekend. Yeah, Pegasus, I, I don't know. We, we, we talked about it a little bit earlier. It's kind of a sore subject uh, for me because I, I don't want to think that we aren't getting James Simon anymore. There's no way that they would have cooled off on James Simon. No way. Unless the opposite is true, which I don't think is the case, but it could be. I, I don't know. I don't, I don't, I don't follow the day-to-day connections of recruiting as close as others. And I've always been very up uh, upfront about that. But James Simon uh, is really freaking good. He is really good. Like, a guy that could help us immediately. Good. I think his floor is Daryl Williams. And that's a pretty good floor. But I don't know. I don't know. So if that is the case, then you would be taking three running backs. And I'm I'm honestly okay with that, but I, I would also tell you that Caleb Jackson's a stud. He's locked in pretty much for two more seasons. Um, and basically two more seasons. He'll go pro after his junior year. And I think Aiden Durham's going to be really good. Okay. Um, you know, I, I, I've i thought about this pretty extensively. It also depends if LSU's going to get a uh, – um, a running back out of the portal. Normally, though, if you're getting a running back out of the portal, that's normally a one-year rental. It normally is, okay? If you're getting an elite one. So, we'll see. Let's go to BT. A little early uh, thing about the USC game. And I've already gotten some angry texts about the Bear Alexander stuff I said earlier. Huh? 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 Uh, n- nothing too crazy, though. We'll see. I mean, I'm down for any defensive tackles. I'm down for any DTs. Uh, let's go to Brian. I personally feel a little about uh, – you feel a little bit better about the USC game than the Florida State game. Uh, you should. Okay. Um, I, I, I will still say this, and I know it's in the rear view. But what happened to Florida State this year, I will never forget. I will never, ever, ever forget it. And – the best teams I saw in college football this season was Georgia. I think Georgia would have won the whole thing, but they lost to Alabama. They got outcoached uh, and outplayed. And Brock Bowers and Lad McConkey were hurt. And Amarius Mims got hurt. But Georgia 
was the best team. And they would have rolled through the playoffs. I think they would have rolled Georgia or Michigan. But outside of Georgia, the best team I saw this year in college football was Florida State when they were fully healthy. Okay? I don't think, and I know there has been so much made about the very brutal, brutal pass we've had with season openers. And there could be a great debate about us not playing very strong season openers. We, we, we can have that debate. I would happily love to have that debate. Because college football, there is no preseason. And the regular season games, even with the expanded playoff, still matter more, infinitely more than all the other sports. William, thank you for uh, the super chat. Thank you so much, man. I'm looking forward to seeing you, man. Didn't have to do that. When you get to pick the next topic, go right on ahead. But I, I say the difficult season opener stuff mainly because Florida State was really just that good of a program. They were. They really were. I mean, they they were a well put together team when they beat us, and they only beat us by one uh, the first year, and then this last year they were really freaking good. I mean. This was their 2019 LSU. Now, they weren't as good as 2019 LSU, but on paper, this was their best team since the Jameis Winston team, and that team was obviously legendary. They had a great defense. I think every one of their defensive players got drafted. Florida State, they're going to have a lot of guys get drafted too. Uh, Renardo Green, Braden Fisk, uh, Fabian Lovett. List goes on and on defensively, and then offensively, two receivers, a quarterback, uh, best running back in the draft uh, on many people's boards, and a really good coach. You know, they're good. They're really freaking good, man. And USC is just not going to be as good as that. They're, they're, they're just not. I saw um, Parker at Stats Award do um, a statistical uh, uh, a statistical analysis of USC next year, and he has USC as a seven and five team according to his numbers. So, I still think they're going to be tough. I do think we're going to get some good luck, though, because we will be getting USC on a little bit of a downturn. Obviously, their defense is going to get better just by default, but, you know, they won't have Caleb Williams. We missed that. And, yeah, their receivers are going to be really good. No doubt, it's USC. Huh? 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 Uh, re- receiver has never been an issue for them. But they're just not going to be as good as the, not nearly as good as the Florida State teams. They're still going to be pretty good, though. They're still going to be pretty good. And Brian follows up in one summer. They created that team through the portal. Yeah, kind of true. Uh, they, they were definitely the best portal team last year, though. I would I would agree with that. Um, but a lot of those guys were were portal guys. So, truth be told, obviously Travis wasn't part of the the summer portal class, nor was Johnny Wilson. But your point still remains the same. It, it still remains the same. And I didn't even mention Jared Verse. So. We'll see. Danny says, which defense will improve more? Poe Boy. I just love that name. Just straight Poe Boy. College football news has us a 10 and 2 hosting Penn State. Oh, Penn State, the rematch. 
of the sloppiest bowl game you will ever see. I mean, that is the sloppiest LSU playing conditions ever. It was a pit. Uh, but still. Now, here's what you're going to do. In the next five to ten minutes, I'm going to answer as many questions as we possibly can. If you do super chat, we'll keep the party moving all night. Don't forget, first $20 super chatter will get this Mason Taylor card in the mail. Absolutely love this thing. And William, I just got your message. Disappointing, man. I'm sad. I'm sad. I was looking forward to it, man. Mason Taylor. Okay. Let's go to Wilk. He says, B should BK go after Damian Martinez? No. All right. No. Uh, because if... And and I, I do think it's relatively seismic. I think out of any of the college football news, I think a major ESPN insider putting out a kid's NIL money like that, you can call it intrusive or you could just call it journalism. You can call it whatever you want to call it. My thing is, you know, with Pete Thamel, who's obviously had his run-ins with, with LSU and me, honestly, uh, I like Pete. I've been nice to him in, in, in press boxes every time I saw him. But, you know, we had our disagreements over the Tyre Matthew uh, saga. And that's way back when. But what what are the journalistic standards to confirm that someone is getting $400,000? Okay. He can get in a lot of trouble if he's just throwing that out there. So he had to have it on rock solid evidence that uh okay, William William is the winner of our Mason Taylor card. Congratulations. Uh he had to have it on rock solid evidence that William Martinez was um was was making $400,000 as a running back, not a quarterback, a running back. So if LSU were to go after him, I guess you would need to at least give him 450000 Or does he take 400000 and view it as a step up instead of a lateral move. $400,000 is a lot for a running back. And let's just say, Wilk, we were to go after him. And honestly, we would like to have another running back in our room. And he is a far more productive running back than any of our running backs in our room. I would say, though, if I was Josh Williams or Caleb Jackson, hey, if, if you're going to give this kid 500K to come to our school, then I need 500K. And Caleb Jackson and Josh Williams might be making that already. So they might say, like Lemire, be my guest. Be my guest. So that's why I tell you that that was the biggest story today. By far the biggest story. Because now, if you do have NIL attached to your name, that makes you, if it's a public, if it's, from a legitimate reporter like him, that would that makes you less enti enticing as a recruit. Far less enticing. And I would have hated that if I was Martinez, if I hit the portal. And a national reporter 
put my business out there like that. It's interesting. It's very, very, very interesting. And he might be wrong. Pete Demo might be wrong. Maybe he wasn't making that. I don't know. I don't know. Now, something else I would mention, and I'm not even going to bring this up to the forefront. But I'm just going to be real with you. Please be careful with every single transfer portal rumor that's out there. All right. So this morning, um, I caught wind of Philip Bleedy or Blitty. Um, I, I still don't know how to pronounce his name. And once I got that, I was like, okay, I actually want to go look at this film. And I got word that LSU is is really in 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 the mix here. So, you know, for me, my time is valuable. Your time is valuable. It takes time to come up with your own evaluation. All right. So just because former five star enters the transfer portal, number one, doesn't mean that LSU is interested. Number two, doesn't mean even if we were interested, if it's a good fit. And number three, it doesn't mean that a player is even good, right? You know, we, we we tend to think optimistically about portal transfers, that every single one of them that has played some are actually really good football players. No, you really need to go actually watch the games. Uh, you know, go look at PFF's grade. On the player, go follow a few blogs of of where the player currently is. See what their teammates have to say about him. See how he he interviews. I went and watched a a Philip Bleedy interview. How he interviews is kind of important to me. Okay, he he interviews really well. Geo interviewed pretty well. That kind of matters to me. It really does. So, you know, you've you really, really, really got to look into it. And that goes for any of them, all right? There was a rumor yesterday about a very, very prominent college football player randomly being linked to LSU. And it made no sense, okay? Not even going to bring it up here specifically. It made no sense. It made absolutely no sense. And it never really caught like the LSU Twitter. But it was out there. And I was like, this wouldn't make sense for any party involved. So what what, what makes the portal so interesting now with rumor season is there really are no journalistic standards with this from a media standpoint because – it's not like NFL free agency where every media member knows exactly when your free agency period begins. Okay. Portal's a little bit different. There, there is no official transfer portal ledger that all of us can go see. At least I don't think so. If there is, let me know. I'd love to have access to that. And there's all these message boards and just cause Joe Schmo has a five star rating on uh, Tiger Droppings or whatever. Doesn't mean it's true. Okay, it does. It 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 doesn't mean it's true. Okay, it's no different than NFL draft rumors. True to a certain extent, chance. The the one thing that that I would say a little bit different is. There's only a certain amount of like teams and trades and draft capital, right? Uh, That 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 actually are out there. In college football, there are infinite amount of 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 possibilities that are out there, right? I didn't think today that the first thing I would get woken up to 
is word of a transfer portal defensive tackle from Indiana. But that's that's just it. <laughs> uh, but yeah, you you always be skeptical. All right. And yes, I, I would be interested in Bear Alexander, but understand that there, uh, there are a lot of questions. We say hi to Player X. Uh, Player X hung out with one of my really, really close friends this weekend. Pretty lucky. Blyberg says, are you losing to Corey and Moore? Uh, yeah, I saw you know one Texas writer say that he's, he's going to flip to Texas or... It might not have been a Texas writer. It might have been just someone predicting that he's going to flip to Texas. You know, it's, it's going to be the team that we're going to need to beat out here. Or maybe it is Oregon offered him whatever they want to offer him. I do think DeCorian Moore is really good. I really, really, really do think so. Um, so, yeah. I, uh, I'm not I'm not worried about it though. I mean, he's going to be heavily rumored to Texas until basically the end here. Okay, let's go to Player X Super Chat. Hey, I, I actually know you've been working hard. I, I, like I said a minute ago, you've been working with one of my really really close friends, Marcus, and uh, I heard everything went well, so it's all awesome. Now, um, you know, speaking of the NFL draft, um. I, I did want to get to this, the, these Malik neighbors rumors. Um, don't pay attention to them. Number one, are there instances where LSU players get flagged for off the field stuff during draft time? Yeah, yeah. There, there's instances where that's happened, and it's really hurt the player. Okay. Um, I doubt it's true, though, what one reporter had to say about Malik Neighbors. One single reporter. And there is heavy, heavy incentive for teams to leak that stuff about Malik Neighbors. Heavy, heavy incentive. Now, why would that be the case? Well, it's because the top of the NFL draft is very ambiguous, and... What's up, Jared? Thank you so much. And the reason why is there are four quarterbacks who have been mocked in the first five picks in the NFL draft all in the past week. All right. So there is a lot of value in getting Malik Neighbors, who more than likely is going to be drafted after Marvin Harrison. If you're pick six or seven, and you, in theory, could get the best player in the NFL draft at pick or seven, uh, pick six or seven, and you're getting who many people believe now is the best receiver in the draft at six or seven or eight. Then, if I'm a team, uh, let's say at, the, at the, who, who's I know the Giants are at six, so let's say you're you're the New York Giants. Um, the the report said, well, we, we're worried about Malik Neighbors going to a big city. Okay. If I'm the Giants, I'm not saying the Giants did this. And I view Malik Neighbors as the number one player in the draft. I'm leaking that out there. I'm leaking that out there. Malik Neighbors has issues in big cities. Send. Because then, let's just say a team is trying to draft and get ahead of the Giants in the top five so they can draft Malik Neighbors. That would make a lot of sense for a team that felt that way about Malik Neighbors to jump the Giants. To send that to send that baseless rumor out. Because if I'm a team behind the Giants, I could say, well, that's probably the Giants that sent that out. Or there's no way... A kid with that kind of track record, which doesn't exist, there's no way that he's going to go to New York City. There's no way the Giants are going to are going to draft him there. And boom, 
Giants get the number one player in the draft at pick number six. I will stand by this statement. I do not give out Hall of Fame grades for NFL draft prospects from LSU often. Only two other players got it. Joe Burrow did, but quarterbacks, it's just so different when it comes to evaluation processes. Jamar Chase and Patrick Peterson were the only other LSU players that I thought going into the NFL, I would say with a gazillion percent certainty, were going to be multiple-time Pro Bowlers and Hall of Fame-level players. I am I am there with Malik Neighbors. That's so much I believe in this pro evaluation. Now, if you're a patron, you know that I have a verified history of not being so gung-ho about LSU prospects in the NFL draft. And I've shown my work on that. And I don't like doing it. I want every LSU player to go to the NFL. I want every uh, I want every LSU player to be Alan Fanica in the Pro Football Hall of Fame. But that's just not how it works. Some guys translate to the next level. Some guys don't. <coughs> Lance, thank you so much. I really appreciate it. Let's go to Sibley. And there's truth to this as well. There's truth to this as well. You know, I do think people are going back to the gun j- charge with, with Malik neighbors, which is crazy. Absolutely crazy. That he had a gun, which a lot of people do, in the, one of the most dangerous um, cities in America. And every city in America to a certain degree, is dangerous. You want to protect yourself? Go for it. Go for it. But I I just don't... I, if that one report, if all of this came from that, that is total crap towards Malik, and I hate it. Let's go to Chance. He says, why no love for Justin Jefferson? Um, This is just... This is just how I feel about prospects. Obviously, Justin Jefferson is on a Hall of Fame trajectory, and if he stays healthy, he is the best receiver in the NFL. Either him, Jamar, Tyreek, CD. I mean, there's a few guys you can point to. Uh, But as far as a a pro prospect, I, I actually liked Justin Jefferson. I think in that class, I had it Jerry Judy 1, CD Lamb 2, Jefferson 3. Obviously, Judy sucks, uh, but the the other two guys are studs, Hall of Fame trajectory kind of guys. Um, you know, I I had I, I like Jefferson as a, as a pro prospect, and there were a lot of teams that that did, and you know the Eagles made that mistake. But you know, for me, I it, I just didn't love him as much of the, as a pro prospect as I liked Patrick Peterson or Jamar Chase. Those two will always be the gold standards, and that's not. Uh, that that's not like anything revolutionary because they were both going to be top five overall picks. But if I do that, I want to be that certain. And that's how good I think Malik, Neighbor, Malik Neighbors is going to be in the, in the NFL. And, you know, to player X's point, it's not just like, LSU is just Louisiana in general. It is just truly breathtaking, right? Like Devonta Smith's really good. Dontavian Wicks is really good. Um, you know, Davis is a really good kick returner for the Chargers. I mean, there's so many Louisiana wide receivers that go elsewhere. Trey Harris, I think, is going to be a really good NFL receiver, and that's like Malik Neighbors' best friend. Uh, the, the receiver at Ole Miss, well, I wish was here. Huh? 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 But, like, I try because 
to really get a good NFL evaluation, you got to watch a lot of games. All right. So I tried to take my LSU fan hall, uh, fan hat off and be as objective as I can. Do I see this guy translating to the next level? And there have been some really good LSU players that I thought were going to be awesome NFL players. I thought Mo Claiborne was going to run the league at corner. It it just like he, he just wasn't good at the NFL level. Ron Brooks was in here a little bit earlier. I would, I, I guarantee you, Ron Brooks would probably tell you the same thing if he was still in here. If Ron, if you're still in here, I would I would love to know your thoughts. Um, why do you think Mo didn't succeed? Because Mo Claiborne is one of the best LSU football players of the modern era, period. He's, he's definitely in the top 25 players, okay? Top 10 is pushing it. Top 25, he's definitely got to be in there. One the Thorpe. No idea why it didn't work out in the NFL. None. None. I mean, he was so freaking good at LSU. No idea. If you would have told me Eric Reed would have by far the better pro career, I'd be like, eh, don't know. Uh-uh. But he did. Pro evaluations are hard. And so that's why they, they pump so much, so many resources, so many resources. Yeah, I've been working the phones quite a bit. Uh, I'm just getting too antsy about Jane Daniels landing spot. As bad as it sounds, like, like I think Malik is so good, it's not going to matter where he goes. And I know that that is really bold to say about a receiver and. The Giants would be a really bad landing spot for him because it is all the way in the Northeast. It is an outside dome stadium. There have been a lot of ACLs that have been surrendered to that MetLife turf. That is a horrible fit for him. Horrible. The best fit for him would be the Chargers, uh, Malik Neighbors, where you're on a rebuilding team and – the receivers there aren't that good, and you immediately become the number one option. But I think the Chargers are going to go, going to go offensive line. Um, I, I think Malik's so good, it's not going to matter. I really am that confident in him. Okay, Jaden. I, I so Malik's my number one pro guy. Jaden obviously is number two. Um, Washington, New England, Minnesota, or Oakland. I think of these four, Oakland's the best fit. Not in terms of him actually winning, because uh, AFC West is a brutal division. The best coach is the one with the arguably the worst roster in Denver. And then you have Patrick Mahomes and Justin Herbert. Andy Reid and Jim Harbaugh. First time head coach in Antonio Pierce. So as far as winning the Raiders, that's going to be really tough. But the Raiders have receivers. Jacoby Myers... Um, and Devontae Adams. Trey Tucker's an interesting player. Obviously, they have Michael Michael Mayer, who's a really good young tight end for them. I love the Vegas landing spot. I think if Jaden went to Vegas, it would be an awesome fit. Yeah, it's in the AFC, way tougher of a division, not only division, but conference. Um, Oakland Indoor Stadium. You got to remember, Jaden is a huge family man, huge family guy. Well, he's not really been close to his family these last couple of years in California. You go to Vegas, every one of your family members can reasonably go to every single one of your games. Every single one, if they're on the West Coast. So I, I think... Jaden being away from his family and him losing close family members uh, in, in 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 recent years of his life, I think I think Vegas is where he would want to go. Coach who's coached him before, great receiving core, and a fan base hungry for a QB. Indoor stadium, warm weather, division team. The, the teams you play in your division are all warm weather teams. That's out of the Broncos, of course. 
Um, that's a good fit for him. Minnesota is is also a really good fit. Obviously, Minnesota's got better receivers in Oakland or, or Vegas. Um, Minnesota's a really good fit, too. He's not going to Minnesota. It's just it's just too steep. And New England would be the worst case scenario. Far East Coast, weird division. I think the Patriots have the weirdest roster. First time head coach as well. Um, and by far the worst skill guys out of any of the teams drafting high. All right. Washington, I'm kind of in the middle about that fit. FedEx field, it is a grass surface, um, but not not the best facility. Huh? Han, I've been there. Um, but good receivers. Manageable division. Uh, defensive head coach, he's been a head coach before. I'm not a big Kingsbury guy, though. And he's going to be calling the shots. So, not on fire, obviously, about number two or number three. Yeah, it's mm, true. I mean, Kansas City gets really cold in, in, in playoffs, so true. But it's warmer weather than if you're in the Northeast. Hey, Bullfrog, calm down now. Calm down. Here's Amy Cat. What about Odell? New York made him famous after that catch. It's true. Odell Beckham did succeed in New York. He also had Eli Manning. And while Eli wasn't a great quarterback, he's better than Daniel Jones. And Eli Manning is a great quarterback, but I mean, he's not... He never was like elite, elite top five guy. I think he was always in that top 10 ish range. And he was on the downturn of his career. Still, a really good quarterback play. Giants told me had good offensive lines, too. Can't wait for the draft, man. On Power Hour NFL, released a deep dive on Tua. This is interesting. The Celtics tonight, the first ever NBA team to not attempt a free throw in a game. That's insane. That's insane. Okay. Now, I appreciate each and every one of you. Let's see. Do we have an LSU baseball midweek game tomorrow? We do not. Next game will be versus Tennessee 
this weekend. So shout out Bear Jones and the crew. We will have a live stream tomorrow at 6 p.m. Central. Big shout out to Player X and Jared and our top super chatter of the evening. Uh, on YouTube was Player X and on Venmo was William. Don't forget. I will be at the LSU spring game. If you want to sit with me, let me know. If I sit by myself, I'm fine doing that as well. Let me see. Is there anything else I'm missing? I feel like I'm missing something else. I think that's it. You guys, I really appreciate each and every one of you, man. And Bullfrog's going crazy. I don't think it's the same Bullfrog game of cat. That's what's really pisses, pissing me off. Okay, so I, I don't think this is the same Bullfrog. I don't. But the real bullfrog, if you're out there, it's okay for you to do the biggest thing an anonymous YouTube commenter could ever do, which is admit you're wrong. Huh? 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 Uh, but that's out here and over there. We'll talk to you tomorrow. It is. Pow. Hour. LSU, boom! And tonight, we're doing Buffalo Chicken.